something useful to understand when you're helping people with dissociative disorders, uh, whether it's OSDD, DID, uh, or really dissociative phenomena that you haven't yet diagnosed, is that your primary target is not the dissociation phenomenon per se. It's going to be trauma and attachment wounds. Usually trauma and attachment wounds that started out very early in life. Uh, dissociation is a natural defense setup that we've already got built into us. And uh, a lot of the symptoms that we see in a lot of situations have a dissociative aspect something related to the same sort of defense mechanism that leads to DID and OSTD. When somebody starts getting tra traumatic experiences, major attachment ruptures that are not repaired early on in life, um, especially when they're under extreme stress uh, or in intensive ongoing interruptions to their, their natural sort of set up for secure attachment, what ends up happening is you end up with this very multifaceted, complex, defensive bulwark surrounding uh, all sorts of things related to intimacy and autonomic regulation, all of those things that we usually start to uh, get, be, get really well developed early on in life when we have responsive caregivers who notice when we're upset soothe us and get us used to the idea that, oh, I can expect self-soothing. I can expect to re-regulate. When it goes this far, that's too far. Yeah, those those cues are not well set up for somebody who's been uh, abused, neglected, um, harmed early on in life. And so uh, our primary target is absolutely the trauma. It's absolutely the attachment wounds. And what's the way into those? Well, we work, we look at the autonomic dysregulation. It's uh, similar to any sort of work with a trauma survivor complex or shock trauma, except that when you're looking at the level of complexity with dissociative identity disorder, OSDD, those sorts of things, when, when we see those manifestations, uh, you're, you're going to have to take, do, a lot, do it with a lot more finesse. You have to do it with a lot more care. Uh, because the level of complexity is much, much greater. For DID particularly, uh, you'll have people that have um, the, the separative, separate identities with, with amnestic breaks, and each one of those identities is going to have its own defensive structure and set up its own age structure and that sort of thing. Even if it's not adaptive in the long run, it was absolutely an, an ingenious survival sort of strategy that set up by the system non-consciously. And so uh, when it comes to the the what integration means in the sake of for the sake of uh, DID, we're not trying to smush them all into one personality. We're not trying to end the dissociation. That's that's uh, the the, the ill-fated attempts of yesteryear. People tried to do that. They tried to smash the the, the uh, personalities together. They tried to uh, target the dissociation and say, "Oh yeah, we've got to stop the dissociation. We have to hedge against dissociation." Uh, not exactly. Not exactly. What we're looking at is we're looking at a deeper exchange of energy and information between different segments of the nervous system that are operating non-cooperatively uh, and, and, and uh, non-responsively to one another. Dissociation becomes a more conscious talent and something that can be worked with and leveraged when you're treating the trauma effectively, when you're working with uh, autonomic regulatory patterns, when you're having them get used to the idea of tolerating in uh, more intense emotions and sensations without splitting into other personalities, or if they do split, that the personalities start to talk to one another. You see, you see this pretty organically with certain people that have uh, learned how to make peace bet between their alters, um, or or people that, you know, for example, with OSDD that have gotten used to the idea that when I get this severely upset about something, it's from a different part of me. So they're able to stay intentional a little bit longer. Uh, and so when it comes to encouraging that sort of integration, there's the cognitive part where they have the idea of parts talking to parts, or in the case of OSDD, when, when we don't have really s severe intensive splits between the, the identities. Um, just being able to get used to the idea that this is this is a portion of me that's operating under a different time frame and then allowing for that exchange of energy and information. And what does it look like when we're allowing an exchange of energy and information in the nervous system? Well, 
it looks like activation uh, of emotion, activation of like intense sort of like waves of sort of tension. It's hard to call it tension per se because it's like multiple parts of the nervous system tense. It's not merely muscular tension. It's not merely visceral tension. It's more like rapid tensing and untensings of multiple parts in the nervous system. The net effect is going to feel like stuff like uh you know tingles shivers wobbles butterflies um on the more uh, ugly end uh, sometimes heat to the point where you wonder if something inside you is going to blister um sometimes uh nausea you know and it, it takes some some release of the tension around the nausea for it to not turn into full-on puking if you're able to to keep them in a place where um, they know that they're being heard. They know that they're being helped. They have trust for you. And so there's absolutely a role for listening and all that. Listening comes first. <laughs> listening with your ears, listening with your eyes, and absolutely listening with your body, feeling the visceral sensations inside of yourself and the, the activation changes inside of yourself. Um, but then after the listening, after they realize that this person really is honest with me and is going to help me, they're not like the person that was hurting me before, um, and they can feel that on a deep level, then soon enough, we get to the actual technical process of uh, getting them used to, this is what it feels like when I am about to experience an emotional release. The stuff that was shut down and walled off and insidiously impacting their lives moves into a space where they start to feel uh, to something inside of them, like their hair might feel like it's on end. They might feel their heart rate rising. They might feel the warmth or the heat. They might feel the trembles and being able to get them to slow it down enough so it stays tolerable so that they don't have to exercise their their uh, former you know survival strategies where they can stay in a state where this is okay. My feelings are okay. Soon enough, the shock responses release. Emotional responses come through in a stepwise tolerable manner and they find themselves less and less triggered, more and more resilient. And when it comes to parts talking to parts, they can actually just straight up ask a, a part of them, whether it's a, a full on separate identity, a shell identity, or a, a, you know, like a, just a, a feeling that's super strong and seems to act independently. They, they talk to it like it's a person, like you would with IFS or structural dissociation model work. And just ask it directly, can you send that feeling into my current adult body so that you're not alone in it. I mean, really, not only are they witnessed by you as the helper, but they're also creating a, a system of witness wit and witnessing from within. And there's a curious thing that happens with that. Um, I'll often tell this to people because it seems to keep proving true. Nobody can give it to you like you can give it to you when it comes to witness, when it comes to empathy, when it comes to understanding. And so uh, a therapist or, or a coach or provider who's, who's breathing with them, staying with them, attuning to them, uh, will have them uh, ask this question to this part of themselves, right? Would you send that anger into my body just a little at a time? I don't know how much I can take, but, but test me. Let's send a little anger into my body. I'm going to breathe it in. They breathe feeling comes in, they start to feel exactly these phenomena we were talking about. It goes from shut down to sort of a tension somewhere inside to an activated state to a to an expansion. And then the integrative process keeps moving forward. It usually goes in waves of, of tension, activation, expansion, tension, activation, expansion. And uh, then what happens next? Well, they're less triggered. They're less triggered. And so at that point, dissociation becomes more of a thing that is is going to be able to be leveraged because they're able to stay more intentional in the face of stress. Um, what's our target? Trauma and attachment wounds. How do we get there? Work with the activation levels. We're working with autonomic phenomena, uh, noticing, being with, uh, using your major counterbalancing weights against your threat response system. You're soothing the threat response system by, by seeing it properly, framing it or reframing it properly on the cognitive end using your medial prefrontal cortex, but then also on the ventral vagal end and on the, the vagus nerve system end, you're, you're looking at changing breathing patterns, using, using your thinker to turn attention towards the body. So you're feeling your feelings back. 
Uh, but yeah, you'll find out real quick uh, how much a person can take because uh, when you're looking at dissociative identity disorder, you're looking at um, really intense trauma, really severe attachment ruptures. And so um, you can bet that when you start touching into feelings, uh, you're, it'll, it'll show if they are ready for more or if not. If, if you find that they're um, splitting between multiple personalities or identities while you're talking, uh, it's like chances are you're pushing too hard. You know, especially if if the identities are then pushing the the original consciousness you were talking with out, and if you're looking at amnestic splits between them, um, if, if if you're able to gain rapport with with multiple identities, uh, great. You know, great. You're, we're not trying to stop them from splitting per se. We're, we're we're trying to get whatever identities are willing to work with you to teach the body to open nature's energetic exhaust pipe just to basically let the shock response and the survival energy frizzle off then let the emotions start to get integrated we get these mixed states like uh, uh along with the autonomic changes we get um mixed states like um sadness mingling with uh fear and mingling with anger so you get this sort of empowered enriched uh patient sort of state uh, from from there, there's usually some other feeling that starts to come into the mix, like hope, and that stuff is is the fuel that keeps it going. You feel the hope because underneath it all, people are hopeful. Underneath all the wounding, people are uh, passionate. They're compassionate. They're uh, curious. They're creative, and that's the stuff that starts mingling in when you start integrating emotions. And you really have to be able to handle the intense survival energy. Um, not freaking out and abandoning them in your mind by checking out emotionally. You actually have to do your own work so that your resiliency is expanded on an emotional level. You're ready to meet them with uh, the intense surge of feelings that they're going to have. And you're treating the, the dissociative identity disorder by really treating the trauma, letting the uh, your, your your consciousness become sort of a combustion chamber through mirror neuron responses. So um, good luck with helping your dissociative patients.